Hi there, welcome to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. And today we're going to speak about um, hmm, a lot of things. Um, as you can see by the thumbnail, the uh, prophets amongst us. I'm going to talk about the fact that the, the workers that will be going out during this tribulation period, that they are, as I've often said, that the church is an apostolic and a prophetic entity that will go out into this world. Um, so if you think of a prophet, a prophet has a message. If you think of an apostle, the word apostle means sent. So they are sent with a message. Okay, so this will, uh, this teaching is about what we can expect and um, just the things that Father has opened up to me during the course of this week that I want to share with you that is most definitely upon his heart. But before we start, <clears throat> I would just like to, for us to pray. Father, I thank you for the absolute privilege that this is to be able to minister to your worker bride and to those who just want to, want to grow in you and in your word, Father. Father, you are the one that ministers to each and every single person's heart that knows what they need to hear from this teaching. And I pray, Father, that our hearts will be receptive to hear what you have to say. I just thank you for your anointing upon me. I thank you that you anoint these clay lips and you anoint our ears, Father, specifically our ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us in this late hour, Lord, that we will take it to a heart, that we will not uh, dismiss it, that we will sit with Scripture before us and just have a heart to hear from you, Father. I thank you, Father. This is not my word. This is your word that you want to speak to your children. I just praise you for that. And I pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay, so as I said now, the church in this end time, the, the worker bride that will be sent out. A lot of people ask me now, who's the worker bride? And Yeshua said that we are to pray for the laborers, um, that the laborers are few, but the harvest is great, Right. So when he said that to his disciples, there were just the 12 of them and the few followers that followed at that stage. But now we know there are even more, uh, you know, millions of Christians out there. But they're not necessarily all laborers. He has prepared in this last hour for the Great Tribulation, he has prepared a group of people that will be going out that is part of his bride that will minister amongst the nations. And um, he speaks of this um, to his disciples in Luke 11, when they came to him and asked him, tell us what will happen. So it's Luke's discourse in Luke 11. And, he, and they want to know from him what will happen in this time. You know, what are the signs and those kind of things. So let's read that in Luke 11, just as a backdrop for what we are dealing with here. Okay, Luke 11 from verse, from verse 29. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. So now we're reading this in eschatological viewpoint, the future. Okay, because this is Luke's discourse. He's saying what will happen. This is an evil generation, this generation that we are in now. They seek a sign. And there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. Okay, so we have to do with a prophet here. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Okay, so the prophet is a sign. Jonas was a sign to Nineveh. So he says the Son of Man will be as Jonas. In this generation, in this generation that we are in now. Okay, then he says the following The Queen of the South shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. So, the Queen of the South, you will, uh, I will put it in the description as well, the link to my video called The Queen of the South, where it's a very clear description of who she is. And it basically boils down, she is the bride of the king. She's the queen. Okay, she's the king's bride is the queen. And she has virgins. 
These virgins are those who grow up under her. They are also considered part of the bride. Both the bride and the virgins in that time were responsible to produce children to the king. They were considered as, both parties were considered as the wife of the king, so to speak. We get the example of Leah and Rachel, that they had their servants that also had to produce uh, 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 children. The same with Sarah, she had Hagar, which was a virgin that had to produce a child for Abram. Okay, so the bride has her virgins following her and the lamb has his virgins following as well. Or the eunuchs, if you can call it that. Okay, so this is what this queen of the south represents. She represents the wife or the queen of the king, right? And the men of Nineveh, because the queen of the south is a reference to the queen of Sheba that went to King Solomon. Okay, she brought him spices and she wanted wisdom from him. That is the bride. The bride comes to the king. She brings spices. She lays her life down as a fragrance and she receives wisdom from him. She has her virgins, those that she teaches. Okay, and she teaches them how to be beautiful brides as well and also to bring forth children. These are what the men of Nineveh represent. Nineveh represents the Gentiles. So it's the Gentile bride, the queen of the south, that rises up with Jonas the prophet and come in judgment. So she is as a prophetic entity sent with judgment. To do what? With the men of Nineveh to condemn. So let's read that again. For as Jonas was a son unto the Ninevites, so, so also the son of man to this generation. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth, representing the Gentiles, to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. So we have two entities here. We have the king and we have the prophet. We have Solomon and we have Jonas. And then we have the queen with um, the men of Nineveh. The men of Nineveh, okay, the virgins, shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas, talking about Nineveh in that time. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Then he says the following in verse 33. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, putteth it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick. They that which come in many see the light. Okay. So you will um, see on my channel that I did a, uh, a word that Father gave me. Um, a light in the darkness and I talk about the early Christians that were known as the candlesticks of Christianity who were uh, torches, Nero's torches that he put uh, uh, fire to um, during their parties and those kind of things. So here Yeshua is actually talking about those candlesticks and was also a reference to Revelation 1 where Yeshua is in the midst of the lampstands which represents the churches. Okay, so the Queen of the South she is that light, the Elijah, the John the Baptist, who is said to be as Elijah, who was a light pointing to the light. He was a candlestick pointing to the candlestick. So the bride is, has the light of Christ in her and the light shines in the darkness, meaning that time period of judgment and the darkness cannot overwhelm it. Okay, so what does light do? Light exposes that which happens in the dark. This is what the bride will do. She will rise up as a prophetic voice. Okay, and that prophetic voice has to do two things, which was the case with Jonas. The first thing is to say, you have not listened. You have not listened to his voice. She condemns. But what she condemns, she also judges. 
saying, because you have not listened, this and this and this is what will happen. This judgment will now come upon this earth. So she will be used as a prophetic voice to condemn this evil generation. The workers will condemn this evil generation and will speak God's judgment over it. So she will be given great authority to be able to do that. Okay, so with this devotional teaching, there are a few things that basically forms the highlights of what I actually want to bring across. The first one is to understand that prophetic call, okay, which I've basically now discussed in a way. The second is to differentiate between the office of a prophet and the gift of prophecy. It's important that we understand the difference. And the third one is what are we to expect in this time as worker, as the worker bride, when we are rising up with Christ to judge and condemn this evil generation? What are we to expect? And the fourth thing is his provision in this time. What can we expect from him in this time? So these are very important uh, 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 points that we need to consider and take to heart and take to him as well. Now, understanding the core, I think for that, I actually need to testify about how this devotional teaching started. And it started about um, uh, slightly more than a week ago when I it was just before light in the darkness that uh, uh, the video that I made that I sent out the word, the word from the Lord where I woke up the morning and I had such a deep deep sense of agony of spirit of sorrow in my heart um, I was crying so much and I didn't understand why I was crying so much until I realized that after I posted these words that he gave me, there, there, there was just the sense that came over me of, do they really hear what you are saying, Father? Do they really consider? Do they actually stand still and listen to what you have to say? And such a sadness came over me. Sadness doesn't really uh, define it. I, my spirit was broken in me until I realized that the reason why I was crying so much was, was because I was burdened with his burden. I was burdened with, with having to have heard his word come to me. Where his anointing comes over me and I start to write what he speaks to my spirit. Because my spirit receives the word. And I start to write and I just sense his heart in it. And then to take something so precious, so beautiful. And just put it on YouTube. And know that people won't necessarily consider the weight of it and the value of it. Because in today's age, there's a prophet a dime a dozen, and there are words a dime a dozen, and, and, and uh, uh, prophetic uh, uh, words that go out and, and, and warnings. And some true and most of them not true. But the point is how, how we have become inundated with this type of thing. That we, we see it but we are not arrested with the fact that God is speaking. That the creator of all things speaks and he wants us to listen. Especially in the time that we are in. And the other day I was at the chemist. And I don't remember why I th thought this. I was just looking at the people. I just had those moments where I just look at the people. 
And I was thinking of the investment that God makes in our lives. His own personal investment in your life. Where the word says that he is like a refiner over a refiner's fire waiting for his image to reflect in that furnace, in that gold that's being purified. And how patiently he waits over our lives. And what he puts into it to form us and to sanctify us. What great value he places on man's life. On those he died for. On those he called. What value he places on his children. And I, I just started thinking of the investment the personal investment he makes in your life, in my life. And that then made me th start thinking of the investment that he makes in a prophet's life. And as I was thinking of this, the how the, the journey and the path that he has walked with me personally, the how he prepared me and brought me to a place where I could receive this precious words from him. And knowing the investment in my life, therefore the value of the word as well as from who it comes, to then take that, it's, that's something that is so precious, and to put it out there for everybody to hear. I am jealous over his words. Fiercely jealous over his words. And I started crying. Because I had this sense. I had this vision of me walking down the marketplace. And I had the view of the ground just like this. And I took a bag like a pouch full of pearls and I threw it on the ground and I just saw the people's feet stepping on it and I had this idea of oh that's a nice pearl yeah, move along oh there's a nice pearl oh well there's more pearls to be had and that is how we've been treating the word of God when it comes to us through his prophets and this saddened me immensely when I started thinking of the heart of God. And that's when I realized that what I was feeling was what he was feeling. Because he subjects me to things that is in his heart. He has allowed me to feel some of his indignation, frustration, love. We've all experienced love, but what he's allowed me to feel your physical body cannot contain it. You you break down. It's you you can't. Your body cannot deal with that. So he's allowed me to feel a bit of what he feels, and it makes me break down. So he was allowing me to feel what he feels when we do not place the proper weight and consideration. To the words he gives. We've grown so used to it. We've grown so used to it. And it made me think. Of the ten lepers. Uh, were, that were healed. Yeshua told about. And he said that only one leper came back. And thanked him. And the question was. Where's the others? Where's the others? Are we truly grateful. That he still speaks so clearly or have we grown so used to it that we don't even consider it you know the other day I said to him he was quiet for a while everything he does with me has such great purpose I'm so grateful for it and he was quiet and he wasn't speaking to me and I went to sit down in this very place and I, I said to him Lord The only life that I have in me is the life that you are in me. 
outside of you, I have no life. If you do not speak to me, I am as a plant that withers away. I value your words. I treasure your words when you speak to me. Speak to me. Speak to me. Because unless you speak to me, I die. I wither away. You know, Yeshua said that man shall not live from bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is by the words that he speaks to us that we live. It's not just the Logos. It's also the Rhema, the revelation that comes by his spirit. And whether he does it through his word, whether he speaks to your spirit itself, whether he speaks through circumstances, like I said in my previous devotional, when God speaks. The point is, we are to live by the, those very words by which he speak to us, speaks to us. And unless he does, we wither away. Because we are called to be like the trees planted by the riverside. Like Psalm 1. That our leaves will never wither away. It doesn't matter what season it is. That we will bear fruit. That others will eat of that fruit. Because we live, we are planted in the river of God. Water in the word of God is a reference to the word of God. And that's why when we have the river, the water, the word of God in us, we become living testimonies. We become trees of life. We become living epistles, books to read by how we live. But unless he speaks, unless we hear, yeah, unless we value why must he continue to speak if we are not going to listen? So this is what he brought upon my heart. And then he started to build on this and said that he wanted to speak to his children and to the workers that will go out in this time. To have an understanding that in this time when they will speak, and they will speak the judgments of God and the words that he gives them to speak. That they will not listen. And what I sense and what I felt is what he wants to say is what you will have to bear on your shoulders. That burden. The burden of the Lord is that his word is not heard. He who is the word who became flesh, who dwells in us, that life will not be heard. John 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was the light and that light was the life in man. Christ is the life in you. And when he speaks through you his word and you are not heard, then he will cause you to bear the burden, the weight of not being heard. What he feels. So you will not just carry that weight upon you of not being heard, treasuring the weight of his words, knowing from who it comes. But you will be persecuted for it. You will come to an evil generation that hates God and will see the manifestation of God in you and will persecute you for it. And your heart will be broken because they will not consider the judgment that will come upon them because they come against his prophets. Now you will remember that I, I said that the Smyrna group, uh, the Aquilas, the Priscillas and Aquilas are the eagles of God and that the eagles are the connection to the 
the, the prophetic connection of being sent out. In this case, the Queen of the South. Right? So they will be persecuted, the Smyrna group. So we have to understand that they will lay their lives down for these very people that will come against them. Let's read in Romans 1 what type of people they will be sent to. Let's read from... Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So this is the generation we are in right now. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator uh, who, who is blessed forever. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one to another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So this is the generation, this evil generation, that the Queen of the South, those workers, will be sent to, to condemn and judge, and speak of the judgment of God, can you consider the audience? Can you consider God's burden on his heart over the judgment that will come over these people? That the word says it is not his will that any man should perish. That that burden, his burden, will be on his bride's shoulders. It will not be a case of you walking down the street and just calling out to everybody and saying, okay, well, if you don't repent, you're going to die. This is about reaching out to the lost and crying out because there's not going to be another chance. There's not going to be another 2,000 years. We are at the end of the age. This is the last generation. There's not going to be any more chances to this. What urgency and earnestness God would want us to cry out to the lost. What is on his heart? Now the thing that we need to understand is the difference between the office of a prophet and the gifts of, gift of prophecy. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says that he desire, desires that everybody prosper prophesieth, the King James Version, that everybody prophesieth, 
And that word prophesy means to exhort, to reprove, to teach, to comfort. That is not the same as an office of a prophet. The, to, the gift of prophecy is to minister amongst one another. It's to be guided by the Spirit, how to comfort one another, how to teach, how to be there for one another, to bless one another. That is called the gift of prophecy because it's under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But the office of the prophet is different, right? So the office of the prophet, for this, a person has to, that prophet has to be called by God. There's a specific day and calling that came over that person's life. And when that call came, God started to prepare that person, actually even before it. Like he said to Jeremiah, before you were even formed in your mother's womb, I called you to be a prophet unto this nation. So he prepares that prophet and how he prepares that prophet is to absolutely bring that prophet, that person to dust in every area of their life not one area of their life is untouched and what he does is he is fiercely jealous of his true prophets jealous over them he shares them with no one this is why you will find even though they were married they were lonely a prophet is a lonely journer he walks alone with God and God sets him aside for a specific purpose. And that purpose is to know God's heart. The teacher that is in conjunction with the prophet has the responsibility to break open the word of God and bring revelation from the word of God. Where the prophet comes alongside him and breaks open the heart of God. That's why you will always find that the prophets cried out. They were always, they were always emotional beings. They were descriptive. They were writers or scribes. Although they had scribes, they wrote. They, they, they sang songs. They, they were... Uh, 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 they always had to enact a prophecy. They were a sign, as Jonas was a sign. Ezekiel was told he will be a sign. I think Jeremiah was also told that. So they, they are a sign by how they live. So what God does with a prophet is he works in that person's life, strips them from absolutely everything. They hold on to nothing but God. They live by the words that God speak to them. They do not take it lightly when God speaks to them because they know the cost it involved to get to the point to receive that word. They also consider the cost of not speaking that word. And what happens is God reveals his heart to them. Why does he do that? Because he can trust them. Because he worked in them that disposition where he can trust them with his heart. That is why there are so few true prophets. Many operate in the gifts of prophecy but are not called to the office necessary. So we need to know the difference. But the church in this time, the, the worker bride, will go out as a prophetic entity to speak the judgments of God over this evil generation. And he will reveal his heart to them. Why? Because they have already laid their lives down. He has come. And worked in them that disposition that they will lay their lives down as the candlesticks of Christianity. As the Smyrna group who put their necks on the line. 
And therefore he will reveal his heart to them so that what will happen is they will take their heart, his heart, into battle. Okay, I want to tell you of an uh, experience that I had not so long ago, maybe two years ago, could be more. Um, the, in the last um, devotional teaching, I spoke about my friend Chantal's dream where the scorpions came um, to their house and wanted to confront them. And the scorpions is similar to <clears throat> what you would find in America, the SWAT teams and all that. So the scorpions here in South Africa are like our SWAT team, so to speak. And not so long ago, about two years ago or so, I had the scorpions phone me. And that's quite weird for me. I mean, why would they phone me? But a lady phoned me and she said to me, Madam, do you know Bruce? I'm from the Scorpions. I want to know, do you, is this a number for Bruce? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't know a Bruce. And no, this is not his number. This is my number. And she just said goodbye. Now, immediately, Father brought my attention to Ezekiel 2 and 3. Now, we'll read it just now. But the Scorpions, right, are those who sting Okay, with their mouths, they sting with their mouths, they judge and they accuse and they slander. The Romans won those who will want to stone the prophets, right? And what this lady wants to know is, do I know Bruce? Now, I thought, who is Bruce? I must look up the meaning of the name. And the only meaning behind that name is Robert the Bruce also known as Braveheart. Now, it wasn't William Wallace who was the Braveheart. It was actually Robert the Bruce. So what would happen is that when they walked um, in that time during uh, 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 medieval ages, whenever that was, then the two companies would meet each other halfway and they would ask, are you from Collins or you are from Bruce? Okay, so they wanted to know which king do you fall under? And so the scorpion lady phones me, which king do you fall under? And then I looked a bit about Robert the Bruce. I read up about him and he was supposed to go into battle and he never went into battle and felt quite bad about it. And on his deathbed, he asked his closest friend, James, which is another name for John as well, so linked to John, um, to when he dies, to cut out his heart and then he must take his heart into battle. So Bruce was saying, uh, King Robert the Bruce was saying, James, when you take my heart into battle, it's then I'm also going with you in this battle because my heart is there. So the Lord was saying, take my heart into battle. In this time, my worker bride will take my heart amongst the scorpions. She will know my heart. She will understand my heart, but they will not listen. So let's read Ezekiel 2 and 3. Not all of it, but it's a very telling scripture that points to this Jonah figure, Yeshua, the son of man, and his heart of not being heard, and the worker bride that will, will be with him during this time. Okay, let's see here. Let's read from verse 1. And he said unto me, Son of man. Okay, so let's say um, when, when the Lord God spoke to me and gave me this burden and allowed me to feel what he feels about his word not being heard. What he wanted me to understand is, Petra, I'm sending you out and understand people will not listen. This is part of your call. Part of your call is to bear that burden of not being heard and it's very painful when, when you know God speaks a word to you and, and the weight of it bears so hard on you that it's too precious for you to want to share it with anybody and then it to be not considered breaks your heart. So he wanted me to understand that is part of the burden. And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet, 
that I heard him spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation. Think of Romans 1. This word, a rebellious nation. Rebellious means a bitter nation. I did a devotional teaching called Laying the Axe to the Root, where I talk about how rebellion and bitterness are linked with one another. So I'll also put that in the description box, that link. If you want to read the, the blog. Um, I sent you to a rebellious nation that have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. Okay, so I'm going to give you a word. You will speak these judgments over them. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house. He's saying you've got no guarantee whether they will hear. Yet shall know that there have been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, Briars and thorns all pierce, right? Like words. And thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. This word looks means, uh, it's, it's the same word as for face. Do not look at their faces. It means do not look at the person. You can look in the Strong's Concordance, the meaning of looks and face. It means a person. Um, when Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses, they said that God also speaks to them in dreams and visions. They also get dreams and visions, right? Aren't they prophets? And God said to them, to you, I speak to a prophet, or to, to you I speak, sorry, he said, to you I speak in dreams and visions, but to Moses I speak face to face. He was saying to them, I speak to him person to person. He knows my heart. Right? He knows my heart. Know the difference. Know the difference between the gift of prophecy and the office of a prophet. To a prophet I speak person to person. Because I have dealt with that person in the wilderness. Moses was 40 years in the wilderness. God dealt with that man. In order to bring him up to that acacia tree bush in Mount Horeb. To hear him speak to him. He had to prepare him to send him out. As the apostle and prophet of God. He spoke to him face to face. And he's saying to these prophets that he will send out. Do not look at their faces. Look at mine. Do not listen to their words. Don't look at what you all around you of how they react. Okay. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. He says, you don't have a choice, you will speak. Now, when he brought this sense of heartache over me, over his word not being heard, I cried so much because my heart was broken over his heart. Not because I'm not being heard, I'm nobody, I'm nothing, I'm zero. I, my heart was broken because he wasn't being heard. He wasn't being heard. And I got to the point where I said, Lord, I don't want to do this. I, I, I don't want to do this. If it's going to break your heart, if you're going to be ignored so much. And he said to me, you will do it. This is part of the call. And so he's saying here to the Son of Man, whether they hear or do not hear, you must say to them, thus saith the Lord, you must speak to them. 
But thou son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be thou not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. So he's giving him something to eat. What is he giving him to eat? What you what he's eating is what he's going to speak. Okay? He says, And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein, a scroll. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, in other words, completely filled, back and front. And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Then he says to him, chapter 3, Moreover he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. So what God does with a prophet when he gives them a word to speak, he says that word that I want you to speak, it has to become part of your being. He says here in verse uh, 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 um, Two, so I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat your gut and fill thy bowels with the roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Honey is wisdom. So this lamentations, mournings and woes becomes part of of the prophet he has to eat it before he can speak it there is a death that takes place lamentations mournings and woes something happens in the constitution of the prophet of his being and he becomes one with that message so that when he speaks he himself is so one with that message that he becomes the message he becomes a sign unto the people. It's not just that he just speaks, oh, I received something, now I give it to you. No, God takes him through the works. You now have to allow this word to become part of your very being before I allow you to speak it. Just like my son, by the way he died and the way he lived was the message. So you are the message. That is what will happen with those he sent out to speak these lamentations, mornings and woes. He will give them the scroll to eat. They will have to carry the burden, the weight of the word that they will speak. That cannot be taken lightly. Verse 4, And he said unto me, Son of man, Go get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. Not your own words, my words. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language. You're saying, they'll get what you're saying. But to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language. Whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them. You know, if I had to send you to people that, you, that don't speak your language. Then they would have hearkened unto thee. But the house of Israel, my church, will not hearken unto unto thee for they will not hearken unto me this is the relationship between the prophet and god to not listen to the prophet is to not listen to god they will not hearken unto thee for they will not hearken unto me for all the house of israel are impudent and hardened hard-hearted Behold, I've made thy face strong. Now, face is person. I've made your personhood, your character. I've dealt with you in the wilderness. I've dealt with your disposition in life. I've dealt with you through many sufferings. That you're as a person, you've become, your face has become strong against their faces. And the forehead strong against their forehead. Now, this forehead means your brow, you know, your, your, this part. It's like a typical, like a ram uses this part of their head to come against another ram when they fight or against anything. Let me just see what I wrote there about forehead. 
The forehead is H4696 and it means to be stubborn. I've made you to be stubborn. No matter who comes against you, you'll be stubborn. Your forehead will be strong. Um, let me see what else. And the word strong, where it says I've made your face strong, is H2389. And it means a sh the sharp, stout, mighty and hard, firm, courageous, to prevail and resolute. That's what it means. He's saying, I will make your face. You will be resolute. It's one of the words he gave me at the start of this devotional teaching. Um, he said, he gave me the word resolution. To be determined, resolute, endure. Nothing is going to stop you. This is how I will make you against them. And then in verse 9 he says, As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Now this adamant is also the word diamond. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart and hear with thine ears. Okay, so... This adamant, like his forehead, that I said is like a diamond. Use a diamond to cut. But it also comes from H8068. And it means a thorn, a hedge, a flint. Okay? Yeshua set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem to be crucified. In other words, nothing could deter, deter him. No matter what happens around him, he's not going to stop. A sharp stone. Now you will remember in my devotional teaching when God speaks, I, I speak about the fact that he will show through dreams and visions many things that will happen in the spirit realm, but he will also, the things that we will see will be so great that it will be very difficult for us to be able to deal with it. But he says that he, I, I spoke about this vision that I had of this mighty tree that came out of the word I saw the Bible open up and this mighty oak tree growing up and the birds sitting at the top part, right? And and the Lord took me to Matthew 14 where it talks about the mustard seed is like a tree that, uh, that grows so big and the birds come and sit in it. And when I looked up the word mustard seed, it means a thorn. And that thorn... That seed that you sow, to sow it, means to draw a sword. He's saying your forehead will be an adamant, will be as a thorn that will pierce. The sword of the Spirit will pierce them. You will not have to stand back. I will make you strong and resolute. Do not look at, the, at their faces. Do not listen to their words. But know that most of them will not listen to you. Okay. And the interesting part is, in verse 14 of Ezekiel 3, he says, So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness. Okay. He's very sad um, and, and broken. In the heat of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. So he's like, not up for it, like I was. I'm not not up for this, Lord. Who's up for this? Who's up for this kind of persecution amongst these people? And to carry that kind of burden upon you. So Ezekiel here, the son of man, is aware of this burden and he goes away in bitterness. That is how I felt. But the hand of God was upon him. And verse 15 says, Then I came to them, of the captivity of Tel Abib that dwelt by the river of Chabar, and I sat and I sat where they sat and I remained there astonished among them seven days. Now this word Tel Abib, okay, it means let me just see what I wrote about it. It's it means mount of the flood, okay, and it comes Tel, I think is the mount. But Abib is age 24 or 23, and it means fresh barley, fresh young ears. 
it's the abib is the ear forming uh, month of the year of the corns so it's still green you've got green ears you don't hear too well so he sent to that place where they do not hear the word of god right tell abib he sent there and he sits there astonished that word astonished means he is perplexed he is devastated he is overwhelmed he is sitting there much like paul went into athens and the the word says the spirit was moved within him because the whole city was given over to idolatry so the son of man sitting at tel aviv is in bitterness astonished and he sits there for seven days now the word seven or the number seven means completion so there has to be a complete he has to see and look at these people the way god sees them not the way he perceives it he has to sit there and be silent and see apostolic sending and seeing he must see with the heart of god and be astonished be dismayed be devastated over the state and then it says here in verse 16 and it came to pass at the end of 7 days that the word of the lord came unto me so the heart of the prophet is prepared before he receives the word saying son of man i've made thee a watchman unto the house of israel therefore hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me when i say unto the wicked thou shalt surely die and thou givest him not warning not nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked way that includes your family friends and closest family members everybody to save his life the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity but his blood will i require of you from your hand verse 19 yet if thou warn the wicked and he turn not from his wickedness nor from his wicked way he shall die in his iniquity but thou hast delivered thy soul again when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity and i lay a stumbling block before him he shall die because thou hast not given him warning he shall die in his sin and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered but his blood will i require of thy hand so the first one is a man in wickedness the first man has righteousness that's interesting worth looking into Verse 21 nevertheless if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not and he doth not sin he shall surely live because he is warned also thou hast delivered thy soul could this righteous man be the backslidden that still sin that needs to be warned so the one is the lost the wicked the other one is the righteous man the backslidden that they are sent out to warn Um let's go to verse 26 or verse 25 but thou O son of man behold they shall put bands upon thee as you were said they will cast you into prison some of you will be cast into prison the smyrna group like john the baptist was cast into prison so the smyrna group was said they will cast you into prison for 10 days okay But thou art son of man be all they shall put bands upon thee and shall bind thee with them and thou shall not go out among them and I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth that thou shall be dumb and shall not be to them a reprover for they are a rebellious house Proverbs 8:9 says reprove not a scorner lest he hate you rebuke a wise man and he will love you but he says here that his mouth his tongue will cleave to his mouth but when i speak with thee only once i speak to you do you speak i will open thy mouth and thou shalt say unto them thus saith the lord god he that heareth let him hear 
and he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. And the interesting part is that whilst I was reading this, my friend Simone that has the dreams as well, that she gives me, um, uh, left a message, a morning message, just to say hi. And she said that the Friday, she had such a terrible time because her daughter, Linny, um, ear, her eardrum burst. And at the same time, the next day, my friend uh, Chris let me know that her ear, she's got a problem with her right ear as well. And this after I read about Tel Aviv being the green ears that have not developed, not hearing, and this nation's, the nations that will not listen, even though they have ears, they will not hear the judgment that will be spoken over them. But they will not have an excuse one day once this happens. Okay. We mentioned um, the song of, uh, um, we mentioned Solomon in Luke 11. So Jonas was mentioned and he also said that the one greater than Solomon is here. And I found an interesting connection with, um, with Solomon. The other day, uh, about a week ago, I woke up just after the devotional teaching that I did a previous one. I mentioned that the Lord God told me that I'm a mother of thousands, that he will give me thousands of souls. Glory to God. And I woke up um, one minute past five, and it means thousands. Okay. When I woke up, I, I was thinking, I'm sure I, I know what this number means because I've received it often. Um, but it means thousands. But for some reason, for the first time after receiving it often, um, I decided to look up where it's written and uh, he directed me to Song of Solomon 8 and I just want to show you just the reference if you consider that Yeshua says that he's coming as Solomon what he's saying is I'm coming as the bridegroom not just as the prophet but I'm also coming as the bridegroom with my the king with his queen okay that is how I'm coming as Solomon and with my bride who has presented spices like the queen of Sheba, which is the queen of the south, right? And she, the whole book of the Song of Solomon is about the bride and the bridegroom. And in Song of Solomon 8, chapter 8, it talks about her coming out of the wilderness. She's had this wilderness experience with him. And this takes place all in a garden, which represents her heart. Okay, the garden is her heart in the Song of Solomon. And she's coming out of the wilderness leaning on her beloved that means she's so close to him and the part where she's leaning is on his chest where his signet ring is and that is why she's saying set me as a seal upon your heart so when the seal his signet ring is here on his heart was often the kings had to have it on a, they had it on a, a string where the signet ring was so her head is here and she's saying let the impression of me be placed on your heart. Set me as a seal upon your heart. And then she says how, how jealous this love is. Okay, let's read that. Because that's just too beautiful to leave it out. Set me, verse 6, in Solomon, Song of Solomon 8. Set me as a seal upon thy heart and as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death. How strong is love as death? In other words, this kind of love that he has for this bride, he will allow death to take place in her in order for her to understand that love. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. He's so jealous of her that he will cause everything else that gives her life to die so that he is the life the only life in her. He is the source of life. Proverbs 10, 11 says, The mouth of the righteous is a well of life. So she is so united to him, she has no other form of life. His words is her life. And he's so jealous over her that he's cruel in his jealousy over her. He shares her with no one. Okay, 
The coals thereof are coals of fire which have most vehement flame. It burns up everything. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. If you read Romans 8, the last few verses where Paul says that nothing will be able to separate us from his love. Paul is talking about this kind of love. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be contempt. And then she's now talking about her little sister. Okay. We have a little sister. Think of Leah and Rachel. Leah would be a representative because she was married first. She was the older sister. Rachel was the younger sister. Think of Leah as the old wheat and Rachel as the young wheat. The teller beep. She still has young ears. Have not listened yet. Okay. We have a little sister and she has no breasts. She has not fully formed yet. She's not matured yet. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she shall be spoken for? He longs for her, right? If she be a wall, we will build upon her a palace of silver. Silver is righteousness. And if she be a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Okay, cedar trees are very high, very strong representation of the cross. So she's talking about her sister here, like Leah talking about Rachel and saying she's still not formed. She's the younger wheat, the spring wheat, and she's not fully formed yet. Her breasts are not fully formed. Verse 10, she now speaks about herself, the queen of the south. She says, I am a wall and my breasts like towers. Then was I in his eyes as one that found favor. He's looking at her and he goes, nice. Okay. Now, this word, I'm laughing because the dog's looking at me while you were sleeping. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Anyway, the breasts are like towers. Now, these towers was very interesting to look at the meaning of that. Let me just see. Um, where did I write that down? They actually mean to be, they, they were considered rostrums. Now a rostrum is the front part of a ship, specifically warships, that were placed in front of a podium in the, uh, in, uh, the Roman period. Okay, where the Caesar, whoever spoke. So they had the front part of a warship, which was your, usually a figure of some other animal. Okay, um, and it, it would pierce, right? It had a point to it, the front part of a ship. And it says here that her breasts are like these front, the rostrums of ships. Okay, and the podium, if you look in the Strong's Concordance, the meaning of these towers, it means to preach. So, who do these two breasts represent? They represent the two witnesses, so to speak. But particularly, they represent the 144,000, the worker bride that will go out. Yeshua said uh, the commission that he's giving to them is to go out and preach the gospel. So, they, her breasts are fully formed. She is ready. There's milk the word is considered milk, ready to give milk. What does the bride do? The bride is the mother of his children. She is ready to go and feed and pasture the flock to give them food. She is, she is a walled city. And Jeremiah was told that he will be a walled city. He will be a pillar. He will be fortified. No matter how they come against him, they will not be able to overcome him. The same with Ezekiel. They are fortified. The bride is fortified. So the question is, how does she become fortified? Is this just guaranteed? No. He takes her through suffering. That's another teaching I did called Fortified. Also put it in the link in the description. They, she, it takes her through suffering in her life. 
in order to subject her body physically and her mind to sufferings of such a kind that it leaves her completely weak, that the only person she can trust in is him, which cause her spirit to be strengthened, the forehead to become strong, the face to become strong, to become stubborn, to become enduring, because endurance is the name of the game. And so our disposition towards our suffering is so important. Because what he is working in you is to establish you, is to make you a pillar. And a pillar stands alone. It bears the burden from above and below from the foundation. It stands no matter what. This is what he's working in you right now. So that when they come against this witnesses, the 144,000, those who are called out to speak this judgment, those men of Nineveh the, that rises with the queen of the south in judgment, they will be stout. They will be resolute. They will not give in. The anointing of God and the power of God will be upon them. Let's read further, because I was talking about the number thousand. Verse 11, Solomon had a vineyard, okay, that's now her, at Baal Hamon. He let out the vineyard unto keepers. Now, who are these keepers? The workers, okay? Every one for the fruit, fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, she's talking about her own vineyard, okay? My portion that I will minister to. My portion that God has allotted that I will look after. Matthew 22 comes to your mind. Where it talks about those with the talents and the servants that he sent out that didn't bring in. Okay. Very important scripture that. My vineyard which is mine is before me. Thou O Solomon must have a thousand and those that keep the fruit thereof two hundred. So the keepers will get a portion, but he will get a thousand. What is the fruit of a woman's womb? Children. The bride must bring in the children. This is his heart. Verse 13. Thou, the, thou that dwellest in the gardens, the companions hearken to thy voice. Cause me. To hear it. Make haste my beloved. And be thou like a roe or to a young heart upon the mountains of spices. Spices. Like spike and art, has to be crushed for the flavor to, or the favor, savor to come forth. I'm going to read a, a quote by Art Cuts. Uh, my mentor. And, and it was from a, a teaching that I listened to. <laughs> this is the only part of the teaching that I got to. And the rest was history, as they say. But I want to read it to you. And he was speaking about the relationship between God and the prophet. And please understand, I'm not saying we are not to expose false prophets or those kind of things. I'm talking about our attitude towards the word of God. Now... And also, when he will give it to us to speak judgment over this generation. This is what Artcut said. He said, God has a deep identification with that which is prophetic. And to someone touch that is to touch him. To abuse that is to abuse him. It may well be that the greatest enmity against God is visited on prophets for exactly that reason. To assault a prophet is to assault God. How shall I say that without making it sound self-serving or personal? But I know that there is, that it is true. There is something that the world hates. The world hates God. The world is at enmity with God. But the prophet is the visible manifestation of elements central to to God's own being, that the world has the opportunity to both identify, hate, 
to despise and to do evil. So that the testimony of a prophet is a statement of God. Not only when he is speaking, often even when he is silent. Their presence is an abomination and an offense to a world that despises God. You cannot separate the ministry from the man. He is a message himself. The man himself, the investment of God, the shaping of the character, the life is more pronounced than in other callings, with the exception of the apostle. What the man is, is an offense as well as his message. If he is not the message, you may expect that what you have is not a prophet, but a false prophet. In other words, if there's no death that worked in that prophet, whatever message he gives, there's always a price to pay in order to be a mouthpiece for God. There has to be a death that takes place in that prophet. And usually that word will require a death in the years as well. He goes on and he says, you pay a price when you reject disregard, let alone violently reject him, whom God sends in that prophetic mantle, because it is so the essence of God himself in his own being. They stoned the prophets sent unto them, which made the judgments necessary to come. Why? Because to reject them is to reject the word of God. Let's read Isaiah 66. I'm almost finished here. This from verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? Where is the place of my rest? For all those things that my hand made, all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. He that killeth an ox is as he who slew a man. He that sacrificed a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He's saying, I'm not interested in all your works. He that offereth an oblation as if he hath offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. I also will choose their delusions, and will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes, and chose that in which I delighteth not. Yea, the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren, this is the promise to the workers, your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake. In other words, they thought they did a service unto me. They thought when they rejected you, that they were doing a service unto me. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. A voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies. You become his enemy when you reject his prophet because you've rejected him who is the word spoken through that prophet. And he goes on and he talks about a famine of the word that will take place. Let me just see if I can find it here now. I think that's in Jeremiah 23, 23, when he talks about the false prophets, where they ask for the burden of the Lord and Jeremiah tells them, the burden of the Lord is that you are the burden of the Lord. 
because you do not listen to his burden. Therefore, you have become a burden unto him. Therefore, you will no longer receive a word, not only that, there will be famine in the land. Because uh, the famine of bread, the written word, so to speak, the famine of, of bread is a manifestation of closing the ears to the spoken word of God. That's why there will be famine in the last days as well, because the earth no longer wants to listen to its creator. So today I want to exhort you to consider this word and his words. To not pass words given out by true prophets, but to sit with those words and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? What must transpire in me to receive this word? What is my disposition towards the word and to the person speaking? What must I do, Lord? What have I failed to do? What have you spoken to me before and once again speaking to me about? To stop yourself from going from one word to another word to another word of what somebody has to say. From one prophet to another prophet. Like conveyor belts, like McDonald's burgers coming past you and just eating up the next word, the next word, the next word. How cheap we make the word of God. How lightly we esteem the word of God when we deal with it so frivolously, so flippantly. If we esteem the written word so lightly, how much more the spoken word? Because this we have with us daily. But when the spoken word comes, the true spoken word, which has so much great value, such a great cost involved with forming a pole, right? And we esteem that lightly. How we break his heart. How we break the Father's heart. Who sent his word to die for us. Father, thank you that I can bring every listener, watcher of this video, Lord. Those workers, Lord, that will be sent out. Many desire that you will speak to them, Lord. But, Father, if we are faithful to the little that you give us. You will give us more. Open their eyes, Father. Open their ears to hear. Open our hearts, Father, to hear what's on your heart. To be able to minister to one another. Let your word have its proper place in our heart. Forgive us, Father. Forgive us from jumping from one person to the other. For being spiritually malnourished, overfed in a way with junk food. That we're not willing to put the necessary work in, in a word spoken. Not willing to sit with your word, with a word, just one single word and allow you to break that word open to us. Go so lightly with your word, Lord. And there will be a famine. Write, inscribe your word upon our hearts. Give us the grace to memorize it, to treasure it, to love it. Like Psalm 119, Lord. Where David loves your word. I pray, Father, work that conviction in our spirits. I pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen.